Heritage. We are absolutely thrilled to have two of our very treasured colleagues presenting on Asian health, past, present, and future. Dr. Lata Palaniapin is an internist and clinical researcher who focuses on the study of diverse populations, chronic disease, and prevention. She received her bachelor's and medical degrees from the University of Michigan's Integrated Pre-Medical Medical Program. She started her clinical career with Doctors Without Borders in East Timor in 1999. Dr. Pin came to Stanford in 2000 for her postdoctoral fellowship in Stanford Pre Prevention Research Center and received her master's in epidemiology in 2001. Very impressively, she has been continuously funded as a principal investigator for two decades and has received over $20 million in funding for her research from the NIH, the American Heart Association, the American Diabetes Association, and other foundations. She was recently awarded a leave in service by Stanford Impact Labs and the Haas Center Public Service to work with nonprofit partners in India to impact chronic disease prevention in schools, communities, and workplaces. She co-founded, along with Dr. Bryant Lynn, the Center for Asian Health Research and Education, CARE, at Stanford in 2018. I had the honor of meeting her and getting to know her in my space group several years ago. Dr. Bryant Lynn made his way to Stanford after a stint at Tufts, where he received his MD and completed his internal medicine residency. He started trailblazing at Stanford as a research fellow and postdoctoral scholar in cardiology, focusing on cardiac electrophysiology. And he was also a biodesign innovation specialty fellow in the Department of Bioengineering. He's had many clinical teaching and administrative credits, but I do wanna give them time to speak. So I'll name a few. He is the training director for the Joe and Linda Chapati Decide Center, as well as the head of education at Stanford Digital Health. He also founded DFARM, which is a nonprofit that introduces teens to design thinking. He still finds time to precept internal medicine continuity clinics for the residency and has numerous patent, patents to his name. As aforementioned, he is the co-director and co-founder of his co-presenter today of the Center for Asian Health Research and Education. Many of you have seen him more recently this past year as he co-hosted and co-founded the Stuck at Home concert series during the pandemic. Doctors Palaniopan and Lynn, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Great, thank you so much for that kind introduction, uh, Dr. Dunn, and uh, looking forward to you performing at a future concert for us as well. Uh, Dr. Palaniopan and I are really happy uh, to be invited this month, uh, Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, uh, to present our talk on Asian health, past, present, and future. We have no relevant disclosures to report. Uh, today, we'll review the backgrounds of Asians in America and, and Asian health in America, excuse me. Uh, we will talk about Center for, the Center for Asian Health Research and Education, CARE, at Stanford that we founded. Uh, we'll review a COVID discrimination study we conducted last year. Uh, we'll also review the socioeconomic and health differences among Asian subgroups uh, and talk about normal weight diabetes in a specific study uh, on precision exercise prescriptions for uh, Asians. And uh, we'll also end with future directions in Asian health. Uh, inspired by Dean uh, Michael Liu from the Univers University of California Berkeley School of Public Health who gave grand rounds uh, a few weeks ago, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about how uh, and Asian, um, uh, the history of Asian migration uh, to this country has affected me personally. As Dr. Liu talked about, uh, there was a Chinese Exclusion Act that really prevented uh, Asians and Chinese from immigrating to the US. Uh, it was repealed in 1943 by the Magnuson Act uh, when China became an ally of the US during World War II. However, the act only allowed a national quota of 105 Chinese immigrants annually. My father, luckily, in 1962, was one of those 105 immigrants. He always tells this story. So this is my dad on the left. He's sporting his best James Dean look there, uh, very popular at the time. And uh, he always tells us a story about how he was invited to meet John F. Kennedy at the White House, because there were so few international students at that time, but he didn't go. So I always told him, why didn't you go? 
he didn't have enough money and couldn't get a ride to the White House on that day. Uh, but luckily, I was able to recently uh, mine the Kennedy archives and find this documentation. And I actually found my dad's name on the invitation list. This is him, Lim Chow Min. Uh, you lived on actually University Boulevard in Adelphi, Maryland, He's going to Maryland University. And as you can see here on this handwritten uh, invitation kind of roster, uh, I don't know if you can see this from China, so predominantly it was from the Republic of China or Taiwan at the time, and some from Hong Kong. There were only 36 students uh, from in the greater DC area who were, who were in the area at the time. And you can see down here, there are only 93 people from India at that time, 93 students. So times have really changed. It's incredible. I mean, there are probably thousands and thousands in the greater DC area now of uh, immigrants from China, India, and greater Asia, uh, students from China, India, and greater Asia. This brings us up to the current day. So at Stanford, I just wanted to give you an idea of Asian Americans at Stanford. So Stanford, really has this great dashboard where you can see the uh, demographics of people at Stanford. So the greenish uh, bar are Asians, uh, about 20, and this is in the medical school, about 25% of graduate students uh, in the medical school identifies Asian. 11% of postdoctoral scholars, that may seem low to you, but a large percent, 58% of postdoctoral scholars are international. And I'm assuming most of those are probably from Asia. Uh, of the professoriate in the medical school, 24% are Asian. Um, and over 30% of the staff are Asian at Stanford. So uh, really, you know, a strong Asian presence at Stanford. So really, uh, again, happy to represent uh, the community here today. So backing up uh, with a, a, a global view, 60% of the globe is Asian. 6% of the US is Asian. But 30% of the Bay Area, and this is in actually consistent among all the major counties in the Bay Area, are Asian. So that leads us to why Stanford really is a, an ideal place uh, to study and educate the future leaders in Asian health. So, you know, if I were more organized, I would have asked for a poll to be distributed, but uh, you know, not being so organized, I didn't do that. But if you could do me a favor and uh, take a guess. So out of all the NIH funding, so as, as you all know, most of the research funding comes from the NIH in the United States. What percentage of NIH funding, so if you could put it in the Q&A, um, is uh, dedicated toward Asian health? So we'll give you a minute to do that. What percent of Asian of NIH funding uh, supports Asian health? We'll, I don't know if that'll be, we'll see if people will submit something in the Q&A. Just take a guess, put it in the Q&A um, about what you think so somebody said 5%, 40%, 5%, 70%, 4%, 6%. Okay, the closest guess was the 0.01%, although that's an underestimate. So uh, that's, an, that's an underestimate. So we're actually better than 0.01%, but we are at 0.17% uh, of NIH funding goes to Asian health. So really a tiny percentage. And as you recall, you know, 6% of the, US population uh, is Asian. So we'll talk about, you know, I'm a clinician predominantly. Uh, I'm, I, I practice primary care in PCPH. Uh, and let's talk about a clinical case that really inspired me. This case happened, this is my patient. He's been very supportive of our center. He actually, I would call him the inspiration for our center. Um, and he agreed to share his picture here. He is a 74, or was a 74 year old man at the time with recurrent gout and opted for prophylactic treatment. I prescribed him allopurinol. Uh, he unfortunately developed uh, DRESS syndrome, drug rash, eosinophilia, and systemic, syndrome, uh, systemic symptoms. Uh, he was admitted uh, hospital, he was admitted, put on high dose steroids, uh, and luckily recovered, but he had this severe skin reaction that uh, occurs in people of high Han Chinese descent uh, to allopurinol. There's no indication, there's no mark on the FDA label indicating increased risk for certain subgroups from allopurinol. So just to review a little bit of the statistics around this and a little bit of the, the, the information. So the uh, reaction, the, the risk of allopurinol associated 
severe cutaneous adverse reactions, including dress, Stevens Johnson, other skin reactions, highly correlates to HLA B5801. This was a study of about 400,000 people. Uh, and you can see the overall prevalence of HLA B5801 uh, is definitely significantly higher in Asians and African Americans. And as well, the risk of allopurinol associated severe cutaneous adverse reactions uh, is much higher in African Americans and uh, Asians as well. So this it really inspired me as well as my already previous knowledge about differences in Asian health in Asians and Asian subgroups. Uh, I reached out to our local community at Stanford and of course, Dr. Sam Su, our colleague in the Department of Surgery has been working on Asian health for over 25 years. We're really standing on, on his giant, giant shoulders. I know uh, Dr. Dunn talked about big shoes of, uh, to fill, and so we also have big shoes to fill. Uh, Dr. So has been um, really leading efforts to end hepatitis B and end liver cancer, um, and has had a very distinguished career and continues to have a distinguished career in this area. Most recently, he helped push AB 70809 through in California in the assembly uh, that will require primary health care facilities to offer voluntary uh, hepatitis B and C screening for all Californians and provide recommended care and treatment for persons who test positive. So this is an example of how his efforts, even though they started with the Asian community, affect all people in the community, all Californians. So with that, uh, Dr. Palanyapan and I put our heads together in 2018 and we founded Stanford Care, Center for Asian Health Research and Education, uh, really well supported by the community, the local Silicon Valley community, as well as folks in the arts and, and other areas. Uh, we had Wayne Wong, who was, uh, was on our advisory board, uh, John Ruse, among many others. John Ruse was the former US ambassador during the Obama administration uh, to Japan, uh, Parker Lee Jane, Anita Wesley, and of course, great support from uh, Dean Lloyd Minor, as well as Bob Harrington. Our vision is to become, no small task, the premier academic leader in precision Asian health. Our mission is to improve the health of Asians really everywhere. And our goals are threefold, to increase research and knowledge, educate patients, providers in the community, and to improve the culturally sensitive and of course, evidence-based delivery of precision care. Uh, as, as well discussed by Dr. Liu a few weeks ago, uh, we are uh, experiencing a rash or a rise in uh, anti-Asian uh, hate uh, crimes. The Pew Research Center last June uh, just conducted a study uh, looking at the impact of COVID-19 and, and racism. So if you look here, they asked people questions on whether they act, people were acting uncomfortable around them due to their ethnicity, whether they're slurs or jokes, whether they had fear of physical threat, um, and uh, you can see here using, for example, the white population as a comparator, 13% uh, of, of whites responded that people acted uncomfortable around them compared to 39% of Asians, of course, in the black community quite high as well at 38%. And in terms of fear of physical attack, uh, the white population reported 9% having fear of physical attack due to their ethnicity compared to 20% of the black population and 26% of the Asian population. So, you know, inferring an odds ratio, you know, in medicine, we talk about odds ratio. So an implied odds ratio would be about three times the risk for Asians acting uncomfortable around them and a little under three times uh, the odds of um, fear of physical threats or physical attacks. There are a few significant problems with this survey. Uh, most of all, they only included 278 Asian American respondents and they did not add, disaggregate Asian American subgroups. So led by our students, Sierra Han and Nguyen, uh, who were undergraduates and co-term students uh, at Stanford, uh, they led a study one, examining self-reported discrimination and concern for physical assault due to COVID-19, uh, again, last year. Uh, we had it, performed a nationwide survey, 1,800 respondents uh, looking at self-reported discrimination uh, asking about concern for physical assault due to COVID-19, as well as uh, really uh, looking at subgroups. We wanted to make sure that we disaggregated Asians. 
Uh, we use a convenient sample distributed on pole fish and email list serves oversampling for Asian Americans. So here's what we found. So in terms of self-reported discrimination, uh, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, Vietnamese all reported higher rates of uh, discrimination. The rates range from adjusted odds ratios range from 3.1 in Japanese Americans to 3.9 in Vietnamese Americans. So again, if you remember the numbers from the Pew study, there are around three times versus this, we had up to 3.9 times uh, the odds in uh, Vietnamese Americans. And as you can see, there's a lot of heterogeneity among the Asian subgroups. And notice notably, you know, it, some differences in East Asian versus uh, South Asian and Filipino uh, backgrounds. And if you look at concern for physical assault, the numbers were quite different from the Pew study. Uh, the adjusted odds ratio were as high as 4.4 in our study, 4.4 times in Chinese Americans and 5.4 times in Vietnamese Americans. And as you remember from the Pew study, those ratios were, you know, inferred ratios were around a little under three. Uh, so quite significantly different results and really, again, highlights the importance of disaggregating subgroups. Of Asia. So in summary, we, should, we found higher anti-Asian discrimination than previously described in some subgroups in particular, uh, Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, among others, and disaggregation really revealed great differences in heterogeneity among sub subgroups. And we felt there needed to be more studies on concern for physical assault. There's really a positive literature in this area. Uh, if you want to look at our preprint, you can look at MedArchive when we submitted the study to the Journal of Asian Health, which Dr. Polignapai will discuss later. Uh, there's been a recent study since Dr. Liu's, this the recent survey uh, since our studies and uh, since Dr. Liu's talk a few weeks ago, uh, Pew Research conducted this study specifically on violence. Uh, eight in 10 Asian Americans say violence against them is increasing and one in five US Asians cite former President Donald Trump as one of the reasons for the rise in violence against Asian Americans, as you can see here. Um, however, there is hope around the corner. The United States Senate, Senate uh, led by the Senator from Hawaii, um, has passed almost unanimously, I think they missed one vote, a new anti-Asian uh, racism bill uh, to support anti-racist efforts. Uh, anti-Asian racist racism efforts uh, by the federal government. So hopefully that will get passed by the House as well. So I want to wrap up my portion of the talk with talking about our students. Really, our student community has been very active. Again, led the study that I just talked about, the Asian Pacific American Medical Student Association, PAMSA. Uh, they met with Stanford School of Medicine faculty on April 16th and Dean Lloyd Minor and uh, Dean Gesundheit. Uh, they discovered discussed specific areas uh, of uh, improvement, constructive improvement uh, to improve anti-racism in the School of Medicine in its educational efforts. Uh, talked about student well-being, anti-racist policies, processes, and increase in sustained DEI efforts. I know several of you are involved in these efforts. So really applaud uh, the excellent presentation, and I learned a lot from them, uh, from Vivian Liu and Richard Lang, who are medical students. And really great thanks again to the Dean Gesundheit, Dean Minor, as well as um, Dr. Harrington for their support on these efforts. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague and co-director, Dr. Latha Ponyapa. Thank you, Dr. Lin. And thank you, Dr. Dunn, for inviting us today and acknowledging the global crisis that is going on in India now. The Center for Asian Health Research and Education is collaborating with our partner, the American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin. Um, we put out the link in the chat, um, again, if people want to contribute in, in any way that they can. Next slide. I'm going to start uh, by talking about um, my father's story. So my father emigrated to the United States in 1974 as a PhD student at the University of Detroit in engineering. I was three years old at the time. He died 10 years later in 1984 of a heart attack. And I was 13, he was 39. And when I was looking for data on higher risks of heart disease in South Asians, there wasn't any available because Asians in 1984 were often omitted from healthcare data. When they were studied, they were often aggregated 
and important signals were missed, as Dr. Lin showed you with the discrimination data. And if they were included, one group, such as Japanese, were studied, and those findings were applied to very different groups like South Asians. So this led me on a path to try to study Asians in America better. Next, uh, next slide. So these six origin groups make up 85% of all Asian Americans, Chinese, Indian, Filipino, Vietnamese, Korean, and Japanese. So these six groups are enumerated on our US census and death records. As you can see, there are many groups that are part of Asia that are not enumerated on the census. And it is important if you have ancestry in one of these groups to write in your ancestry so we can strive to do better data collection in these diverse Asian subgroups. Next slide. Asians often have the model minority myth of being highly educated, high income, high socioeconomic status. And I wanna show you just a little bit of data on the variation in median household income. At the top level, if you examine all Asians compared to all Americans, you can see that the median household income is higher. However, there is much heterogeneity among the Asian subgroups, and we must strive going forward not to confound race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status, and really separate these variables in our analysis. And these are similar patterns that we see for education as well. Next slide. Asians are underrepresented in clinical trials. On the pie graph on the right-hand side, as Dr. Lin mentioned, Asians make up 60% of the world's population. And you can see that they're underrepresented in clinical trials of drugs that we use. So thanks to Dr. Linda Barman for her questions in the chat about statins and ACE inhibitors in Asian populations. The truth is Asians are underrepresented by a factor of five in the drug trials, and therefore we don't have enough data to understand the toxicities as Dr. Lin mentioned, and we're just at the tip of the iceberg in terms of understanding pharmacogenomics in Asian populations. Next slide. Genomics is also failing our diversity. So these are studies done by our Stanford colleagues, both in 2009 and 2016. And you can see that Asians are even currently underrepresented by a factor of three when compared to the world's population. And this affects genetic prediction that we can do in Asian populations. So at CARE, one of our goals is to increase Asian participation in research, both in clinical research, as well as genetic and other omics research. Next slide. So as physicians in the Bay Area, we are making decisions about Asian health mainly using non-Asian data. And this is something that we hope to ch change at the Center for Asian Health Research and Education. Next slide. It is important to study diverse race ethnic groups. And I applaud the Department of Medicine, Dr. Harrington for their diversity and inclusion efforts because we learn a lot from studying diverse population and it will help us achieve our goal of precision health. There are differences in disease patterns, clinical presentations, and therapeutic response that vary dramatically by race, ethnicity, and ancestral background. We see this in biomarker prevalence, with lung cancer genetics, with KRAS mutations being more common in European ancestry, and EGFR mutations more common in East Asian ancestry, with differences in drug safety and efficacy, as we saw with Dr. Lin's example of allopurinol, with asthma and variable efficacy of beta agonists and those of African ancestry, and in seizure disorders for carbamazepine in Asian patients with a boxed warning for those with HLA-B1502, which causes increased skin reactions also as Dr. Lin described. And it can help us make new scientific discoveries as in the case of breast cancer, where a genomic study of Latino women led to discovery of novel protective variants. The study of diverse populations can help us understand disease pathophysiology, discover new treatments, and personalized care for our diverse populations. 
Next slide. We are fortunate at Stanford to have a deep bench of researchers that are studying differences in Asian health across the lifespan. And we are just at the beginning stages of all of these investigations. Starting with Asian infants who have a 40% increased mortality rate due to maternal complications, led by Dr. Susan Carmichael and Yokin Prophet. We mentioned Dr. Sam So, who's dedicated his career to studying hepatitis B and liver cancer. Our psychiatry and psychology colleagues looking at depression in the Asian American populations, which is much less frequently reported. Our colleagues, Dr. Gross and Dr. Chen, who are looking at the East Asian flush, secondary to a variation in the ALDH2 gene. Normal weight diabetes, which I'll tell you a little bit more about that scientific story shortly. Our colleagues at the Sathi Clinic, who are studying earlier heart disease in South Asians, led by Dr. Raj Dash, with Dr. Alba Kandawal, Karen Barjosa, Shiram Nalamshetty, and Fahima Basi. And then the higher risk of gastric cancer, being investigated by Dr. Juha and Robert Wangs, respectively. So as I said, we are uniquely positioned at Stanford, given our diverse population and real depth and breadth of research to make differences in Asian health. Next slide. I wanna talk a little bit about transnational comparisons and what we can learn from them. I'm gonna start with cardiovascular disease. So cardiovascular disease mortality varies widely in Asian countries from a low of 24% in Korea to a high of 43% in China, with the US at the midpoint at 32%. Next slide. I'm gonna take two examples. First, China, and then India. Both of these countries have 1.4 billion people each and combined make up one third of the world's population. In China, when we examine major cardiovascular disease mortality, it is stroke predominant. 54% of people who die, die of stroke, and 46% of people who die of cardiovascular disease, die of heart disease. In contrast, when we look at immigrants with ancestry from China, Taiwan, or Hong Kong, we see that heart disease is predominant at 74% compared to 26% of stroke, and this more closely approximates what we see in non-Hispanic white populations. In contrast, from India, heart disease is, is the predominant form of cardiovascular disease death, with stroke being less prominent at 32%. In immigrants from India, like my father, heart disease is the predominant form of cardiovascular disease, and this occurs much earlier, as we're finding, and stroke is a much less common form of cardiovascular disease. So studying these gradients of disease in immigrant populations compared to countries of origin and compared to other diverse populations in the US offers us opportunities to contrast and understand contributors to unique disease burdens and advance the frontiers of precision health for all populations. The exploration of reasons for these differences in cardiovascular disease gradients offers rich opportunities to study genetic, environmental, and cultural variations that may underlie these distinct mortality patterns. Next slide. Now I wanna move our discussion to cancer, which also has an interesting patterns. So cancer mortality varies from a low of 10% in India to a high of 33% of deaths in Korea, with the US all race ethnic groups aggregated at 26%. Let's take two examples here. First, we'll examine Vietnam. In Vietnam, 18% of all deaths are due to cancer and liver cancer makes up 2% of all cancer deaths. For non-Hispanic whites in the US, one out of four deaths are due to cancer and 2% of these cancer deaths are due to liver cancer. In contrast, Vietnamese Americans, one out of three have cancer as a cause of death and 16% of these cancer deaths are due to liver cancer. So this is overrepresented by a factor of eight. In Korea, we see a similar pattern with one out of three deaths being due to cancer. With gastric cancer, it's 12% of these cancer deaths. 
In non-Hispanic whites, gastric cancer makes up 2% of the cancer deaths. And for Korean Americans, this is overrepresented by a factor of seven. So this gives us opportunities to identify and learn from these high-risk groups in the US to help us make new scientific discoveries and identify new pathophysiologic mechanisms and treatment strategies. We may also consider implementation of successful international screening strategies, such as gastric cancer screening, which has been successful in lowering gastric cancer mortality in Korea. And these efforts are being led by Dr. Ju Ha Wang. Studying high-risk groups, identifying high-impact clinical strategies, and implementing policy changes can improve outcomes for all populations, as evidenced by the HEP B and C screening strategies pioneered by Dr. Sam So, who is now creating positive policy changes for everyone in the United States. Next slide. So we have at the Center for Asian Health Research and Education been able to use big data in Asian health using national data sets, international mortality records, and electronic health records to uncover consistent signals on health. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about a scientific story on one of these scientific signals that we've discovered. Next slide. So diabetes is very prevalent in the United States at about 13% of the population. One thing that we have been noticing, and I'm sure you've seen in your clinical practice, is that Asians tend to develop diabetes even at normal levels of body weight, so body mass index of less than 25. And this is work that I and others have done showing that prediabetes as well as diabetes is higher for Asians at all age groups and every BMI level. Next slide. The prevalence of normal weight diabetes is higher among diverse race ethnic groups in general, and particularly among older ages. The high risk of diabetes at low BMI may be due to factors beyond just obesity. Next slide. We've also seen an obesity paradox. So this is work done by my fellow postdoc at the Stanford Prevention Research Center, Dr. Mercedes Carnathon who showed that adults with normal weight diabetes have double the mortality rate of those who are overweight and obese. And this was theorized to be partly due to adiposity, the amount of body fat that we have, particularly in metabolically active fat depots, such as visceral fat, or relative sarcopenia, or less muscle mass. And we had not yet explored the effects of physical activity on body composition and total body fat in normal weight diabetes which is a clinical problem that is overrepresented in our population specifically. Next slide. So the majority of global diabetes prevention trials enroll overweight and obese individuals. There were no trials of prevention in normal weight individuals who make up 10 to 20% of those with diabetes as we saw in the previous slide. The United States Preventive Services Task Force for Diabetes Screening recommends using overweight obesity as the main screening criteria, and this misses a substantial number of individuals, especially those in race ethnic minority groups, as we saw. And the data on the most appropriate treatment strategies in normal weight diabetes is scarce, and we don't have adequate recommendations for prevention and treatment. Next slide. And the current American Diabetes Association guidelines emphasize aerobic exercise. And I'm sure all of you have counseled your patients, 70% of people in the United States don't exercise enough to simply start walking. Next slide. I wanna thank uh, the Strong D team who are all listed here. Next slide. And I wanna spend a few moments talking about future directions of care. Next slide. We've been fortunate to have a robust um, conference schedule in the three years that we've been in existence with conferences dedicated to gastric cancer, evidence-based traditional Asian medicine, and internet, the International COVID Conference, which was uh, put on last year in May and uh, will occur again in May 14th. We put out the um, link in the chat, and this is co-sponsored by the Center for Population Health Sciences the Center for Innovation and Global Health and the Center for Digital Health. And I wanna acknowledge for the Evidence-Based Traditional Asian Medicine Conference, the tremendous support by the Chi Li Pao Foundation and Dr. Gloria Kim, 
for bringing these therapies, which one out of three of our patients use, into uh, the mainstream of, of scientific evidence and discovery. Next slide. I want to thank our leadership for support of this new center. Both uh, Lloyd Minor and Dr. Harrington have been very generous with their time in supporting these events and our students. Next slide. We've partnered with the Stanford Health Library in community talks, um, and we're also sending out the links for these community talks uh, there. And I want to acknowledge the many collaborators in these uh, community talks, including Dr. Aruna Subramaniam and Dr. Ann Singh and Dr. Fumi Aikino. Next slide. I want to let you know um, a little bit about the science that is going on. We started a seed grant program in 2019, and you can see the um, wide variety of projects that are uh, being pursued by our investigators. We've had over 100 seed grant applications for Asian health in particular, studying everything from pharmacogenomic differences to thyroid cancer to emergency medical therapies and abdominal aortic aneurysm. So we're looking forward to the results of this science in order to apply them for precision health. Next slide. I want to thank Dr. Malathi Srinivasan for directing our very successful Care Summer Scholars Program. She has pivoted to online for a nine-week summer immersion program in data science in vulnerable populations. And these students have been very successful in um, creating um, science in, in peer-reviewed journals, um, which will improve the pipeline in Asian health going forward. Next slide. And also thanks to Dr. Paul Wang, who's editor-in-chief of the relaunched Journal for Asian Health. Um, we hope to have our first relaunched uh, issue in July 2021 and have two uh, issues a year to start to contribute to the understanding of social and medical determinants of health in Asians in the US and elsewhere. Next slide. So in summary, um, we have just started with Asian health with physicians, researcher, researchers, community health advocates, and the generous support of our philanthropic community. In five years, we hope to positively impact our community through educational efforts, and engage other stakeholders. And in 10 years, we hope to make inroads into clinical recommendations, changes in health policy, and create a sustained funding environment so that in 20 years, we can say that Stanford was a leader in improving Asian American health outcomes. Next slide. So we invite all of you to collaborate with us on studying Asian populations, which are uniquely Stanford. So we have put out the web link in the chat. It's care.stanford.edu. And want to highlight just for a moment a few of our upcoming conferences, including on May 14th, the International COVID-19 Conference Lessons Learned, the Community Health Talks coming up, and also the Stuck at Home concert led by Dr. Bryant Lynn on May 20th, celebrating Asian grandmothers. Next slide. So we're looking forward to your questions and thank you for your attention and for your time today. Thank you both so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, there are some questions in the chat. We'd actually like to start with uh, Dr. Ahuja has a question from the panel. Thank you, Tamara. Lata, I really appreciate your very well-rounded talk. I've heard you speak over the years and your compelling science and your background and the personal touch you put into your talks is superb, so thank you. My question to you is you mentioned earlier in the hour that there is a lower recruitment of Asian Americans into clinical trials. And I'm wondering if the strong emphasis on Western medicine for this group, Ayurvedic medicine, et cetera, might be preclusive from them being interested in enrolling. What are your thoughts on that? I think that's a great point, Dr. Ahuja. Thank you for your question. I think that um, 
we need to do a better job in the medical community about addressing the barriers to participation in clinical trials. Some of the barriers to um, participation are similar for diverse race ethnic groups in general, in terms of, of less time, for instance, uh, childcare issues, being able to um, have the um, understanding of concepts that may be more prevalent in Western uh, cultures like randomization, for instance, flipping a coin, getting a placebo. And, and these um, concepts may need to be better community, communicated to, ver to diverse populations in order to engage them in medical research. Also engaging our communities and feeding back to our communities, our research results, and the importance of participating in medical research so we can understand pharmacogenetic differences, for instance, that were brought up earlier. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, race-based medicine at this time. And one question was, how do we go about dismantling race-based medicine and, and its negative effects, but acknowledge, of course, and pursuing the links between certain conditions in Asian Americans like gastric cancer in Koreans? Dr. Lin, do you wanna take that one on or I, I can? I mean, I think that's, it's a, it's definitely a tightrope. I think that's, it's interesting looking at, you know, from different, communities and backgrounds, I think you need to look at the positive things and uh, what interventions we can have. So I think focusing on screening like Dr. Sam So has done is, a, is an effective way of not necessarily um, you know, bringing in the negative aspects of race-based medicine, but really a population health approach, which is more on um, you know, what populations are at risk that we need to screen. So I think that's a place to start. I don't know if I have a great answer for that. Uh, do, do you have any other thoughts, Dr. Palamyampa? Well, just adding to those excellent comments, you know, I think that we all want to be the best doctors that we can possibly be for our patients. And the fact is that we don't have enough data on all of our patients, not just Asian, all race ethnic groups. And we need to strive to study these diverse groups. And we have learned a lot by the studies that we've done, as I showed in the slide, of understanding differences in KRAS and EGFR and protective uh, variants for Latino women and breast cancer and the, the pharmacogenetic differences that we talked about with beta agonists and um, uh, HLA variations with carbamazepine and allopurinol. And, and Dr. Meitner put it really well, Dr. Lloyd Meitner, when he spoke that we will never have precision health until we study all populations and understand all of these variations in disease. And as I, as I said, we're just at the tip of the iceberg and we do need to go several layers deeper and uh, it's not something that we'll solve next year, but hopefully we'll be able to take some important steps forward and, and hand off the baton um, to the next generation because there's lots to do. Great. Well, we, it is nine o'clock, but we have a few questions. If you're available to stay for a few minutes more, we can go a little over. Sure. Great, thank you. So um, Dr. Ash asks, well, first he says, wonderful work. And what are the best implementation strategies to increase gastric, gastric cancer screening in high risk Asian Americans? I think I'm, we can channel Dr. Huang, our colleague on this and you know his view, and he's the expert in the area and, and him and Dr. Robert Huang uh, are to, you know, since everybody's undergoing uh, colon cancer screening uh, to do the, to get the upper endoscopy at the same time. So, uh, his approach has been to advocate for getting an upper endoscopy at the same time as getting your initial colonoscopy. Of course, then for people getting stool screening, you know, we don't have an alternative for that. So that, that is a gap there. Uh, you know, so I think more research needs to be done on something equivalent to a stool screening test for gastric cancer. But uh, typically, uh, a single screening should be sufficient to determine whether you're high risk or not, whether you need to get additional endoscopies or not. Okay. I'll um, add to that a little bit and shout out um, to Dr. Uh, Robert uh, Wang in the audience. He recently got a career development award with a score of 10. I hope you don't mind that. That is the best score that you can get on a grant. And he is using big data approaches to mine electronic health records to create a score 
for whether people should get upper endoscopy screening or not. And it will include as one of, one of the factors, race, ethnicity, so identifying high risk race ethnic groups like Korean Americans, but also other biological uh, screening like H. pylori test positivity, for instance. So it might not mean that everybody gets an EGD as we do with colonoscopies, but that the primary care provider can, with the touch of a button, understand who to refer for EGD so we can provide precision help. Great, thank you. And last question from Dr. Garcia, um, asking about whether all aerobic exercise regimens are equivalent, such as swimming, swimming versus walking versus running? So um, that's a great question. And we did not study that. And I would love to know the answer to that. Um, and I am not aware of any um, studies that have specifically uh, studied, for instance, swimming versus uh, running um, in terms of uh, diabetes risk. Um, However, our study did show that particularly as people get older and they have sarcopenia with aging anyway, and 80% of the insulin mediated glucose uptake in the body is through muscle, that instead of thinking about just excess adiposity, we might pivot to think about increasing muscle as a sort of positive change to decrease glucose. Wonderful. Um, well, there is one more question about whether or not anyone has studied the difference in um, Asians being able to tolerate anesthesia. Are you aware of any of those studies? Um, so I, I'll start. I know uh, Dr. Eric Gross is uh, specifically studying variation in aldehyde dehydrogenase 2 variants and anesthetic response. Um, and I, I will say that there are differences, but I um, will not take the wind out of his sails because I hope he does a grand rounds on that soon. Great. Well, thank you both so much for that presentation. We really appreciate it. It was fantastic. And that concludes our grand rounds for today. Happy AAPI Heritage Month, everyone. We hope you'll join us later on in the month as well. And we have some great grand rounds upcoming. So thank you and everyone have a great day.